we had two thousand. We had uh, one hundred and fifteen thousand that were positive nationally. A prevalence of one point two seven percent, or one out of every seventy eight dogs tested, uh, was positive for heartworm throughout the United States of America, based on that nine million tests. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, you can also zoom in the state. So just, just to show you, so here is Oklahoma, for example. So you can go to state. Now you can see the counties show up. Uh, and so in Oklahoma, you can see they tested 58,000 dogs. And then you can go next to a county. Next slide, please. And here we are looking at Fulton County. And so you can see Fulton County tested 56,000 dogs. And basically, one out of 100 dogs in Fulton County, uh, Georgia, were positive for heartworm. Next slide. So we now have five years of data. So here is Lyman, New York State from 2011 to 2014. And basically, when it's dark orange, those are when we are greater than 5%. And as I believe 1.5% is the cutoff between uh, the light orange and the pinkish looking color, which is a lighter one. Gray means we have no data. So you can see there are two counties and now one county in New York where we have no data. So Lyman in New York, Lyme in New York State, when I got to Ithaca, New York, there were no case of Lyme present in people or animals in Ithaca. Okay? Now infections with both do occur. Uh, people used to argue about it when dogs would come. They always said they had to be infected somewhere else. But that has changed because now we have Lyme in Ithaca, New York. And if one looks at the CAPSI maps from 2011 to 2014, you can see that the prevalence has gone statewide, because remember there's a huge hotbed around Hudson Valley, uh, that's gone from 9.7% to 12.5%. Okay? Uh, and if we move to uh, the next slide, please. Uh, people here share the opinion that Lyme has now spread across the state, and we believe the data on our map supports it. Uh, you'll see some other data from earlier on later, okay? So uh, it shows you that it wasn't as wide once uh, a few years ago before these maps were made. Also, there is data that is pretty convincing that when the prevalence of positive serology in dogs is greater than 5%, that human cases begin to occur. So now, basically, all of New York State is an at-risk area for human exposure. Next slide, please. So this is some work we did before CAPSI had the maps, when we were just talking about it and we are getting started. And this was data from Lyme disease. And this is a million data points collected by IDEX. So this is only IDEX data, collected a million data points from 2006 to 2007. And as you can see there, the whole state of New York is not orange in this map. Well, in this map, it's blue. OK, but it's not all dark colored. Uh, for Lyme here, we had uh, in 2000, uh, we, in this map, we had a million points, and then by 2015, we had 4 million points. And right now, for 2016, it looks like, again, we'll have 4 to 5 million points of data coming in for Lyme disease in dogs. Next slide, please. This data was taken by folks at CDC, okay, uh, Dr. Mead and others. And they took this data, and they reanalyzed it relative to human Lyme disease surveillance. Uh, and this is a publication here from EID uh, in 2011. Next slide, please. And what their conclusions were that findings suggest that canine serial prevalence greater than 5% can be a sensitive but nonspecific marker of increased risk for human Lyme disease. Because dogs do not transmit infection directly to humans or humans to dogs, the association reflects similar susceptibilities to tick-borne infection. In some circumstances, high canine serial prevalence appears to anticipate increasing rates of human infection at the county level. And conversely, canine serial prevalence less than 1% is associated with little to no local risk for human infection. Canine serial prevalence is a useful adjunct to human surveillance for Lyme disease. So that's pretty interesting. Next slide, please. Michigan. If you look at our maps from Michigan, it's, inter it's interesting. The people are, of Michigan are watching their state get more and more Lyme disease. They are basically under attack from Wisconsin via the Upper Peninsula. They're under attack from Wisconsin through Chicago. 
down in the southwestern part of the state, and they also have it coming across from Ontario. And so New, uh, Michigan is basically getting hit with Lyme disease from three different directions. Next slide, please. On the left, you can see the continuing data for 2015 and the beginning of 2016. And on the right, you see some other work that was done out of the Mich uh, University of Michigan by Dr. Hammer. And you can see that they are looking here at other ways. They were looking at dogs. They were looking at uh, ticks. They were looking at zero, zero uh, conversion in dogs within the state of Michigan. As you can see, they are also, they were, this was done in 2009. And as you can see, before we got started, you can see they also found that Lyme disease is marching across the state of Michigan. Next slide, please. And at this point, we published key factors explaining. We had a meeting before we moved forward, and we put forward factors that we thought would be important in the mapping of these diseases. And I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. Lund to talk to you about the mapping side of things. Thanks, Dwight. Can we go to the next slide, please? So as you see, this Companion Animal Parasite Council has compiled quite a lot of Lyme disease tests and also disease tests for other uh, infections in dogs. Now the ultimate goal when one goes to disease map is to essentially just further animal health. You get to track the disease. You can start talking about trends as Dwight was. Uh, as we're going to do here in a little bit, we are going to develop baseline hazard maps for these parasites and pathogens. And we're also going to construct forecasts from this great data set. Now, in general, for those of you who, I, I, I'll try to keep the math prerequisites down here, but really what we have here is a problem in statistical epidemiology. It's clear why we want to forecast. We're going to alert pet owners and vets, a priori, to possibly high disease levels. And maybe some remediation can be taken to remedy what we forecast. Now, this data set that the Companion Animal Parasite Council has compiled is massive. As Dwight noted, what we had about 9 million heartworm tests in 2015, this is really big data. But in the end, what we would like to do is very analogous to what the C CDC does, issue things like flu forecast maps for pets. Next slide, please. So with this data set, CAPC decided early on that they wanted to try to forecast. There's a lot of things that you can do with data, but from the onset, we thought the emphasis should be on forecasting. So what we did is we wanted to determine what factors might influence prevalence rates of these diseases, like heartworm disease that we're going to take a look at here very shortly. It's, it's a mosquito-borne disease, and of course, that sort of suggests that heartworm might like it hot and wet in the United States. So what we did is we grabbed a lot of experts on these different diseases, and we had an Atlanta workshop. Uh, the results of this meeting have been published, but you're going to see this here in a little bit, the various factors that we're going to use to forecast these diseases. Next slide, please. OK. The CAPC data have the following form. The first two are from Oconee County. That's my Australian Shepherd and Cocker Spaniel. I have these guys tested and put on preventatives all year round. I know they're negative. This boxer next door to me, that, that guy is carrying disease. I'm pretty sure of it. But this is what the data looks like. You get to see what county the test came from. You get to see whether the test is positive or negative. And you get to see what kind of dog it is. Now, what I like about this data is it's massive, but not only do I have just the positive and confirmed case counts, I have the number of negative tests as well. Now, what we look at currently at the Companion Animal Parasite Council are heartworm, Lyme, anaplasma, and ehrlichia. The latter three are tick-borne diseases, and heartworm is vectored by mosquitoes. And again, we have big data. This is huge. 
don't think that we have any information of the travel histories of these dogs. We don't know uh, the level of certainty of the test, whether the dog has, is tested every year or dot, dot, dot. All we have is the data as listed above. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so when one goes to forecast, the first thing that you need is a baseline to forecast from. Of course, everybody in Alaska, if you tell them they're going to have a warm winter, they're still expecting things that us lower 48ers would consider very cold. But you need to forecast departures from normal. Now, how does one obtain departures from normal? Well, we are going to take the data from 2011 and 2015, and what we're going to do is spatially smooth this. Now, for you statisticians out there, there's many options to do this nowadays. Krieging, thin plate splines. I am going to use something called the head banging algorithm. And I love its name, but it's not because I'm a rock and roller. Well, I, I, I actually am. But this head banging is a very interesting technique, and I'll explain it later, uh, but it is particularly adept at handling very rough data. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is our first map of raw prevalences of the U.S. from 2011 and 2015. Blue represents cool, not much activity. Red represents warm. You see that some counties in white don't report data. So out there in the western plains, we're not getting any data. And I'm looking up in Wyoming, and also I'm seeing there in Yellowstone counties, which are very, very cold. So you, Yellowstone's one of the coldest areas in the United States. So you wonder what's going on there. Uh, people test for different, different reasons, reasons in various locations. A vet in New Orleans will probably screen dogs for heartworm, but a vet in Wyoming may only test sick dogs. So this is a bit of a problem, and because of that, we probably have a lot of outliers in our data set. Now, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, is there a further slide? There we go. Okay. So what the headbanging algorithm does is it cleans up the data on the last slide and produces a map that looks like this and will be used as our baseline hazard hazard map. Now, you can see that it was head, the headbanging algorithm that we use actually weights for sample sizes. So if you have one positive test out of three, that's not as much of a problem as 100 positive tests out of 300, even though the sample proportions are the same, being one-third in those cases. So this algorithm is very smart, and it eliminates things that are deemed outliers and, and smooths, spatially smooths, and produces this picture. Now let me show you on the next slide, please, what it does for Lyme disease. So you see the red up in New England, and you see the red, the dark red in Wisconsin and the northern arrowhead of Minnesota, and also some sporadic places out west. Let me show you what headbanging does. Next slide, please, on this data. It gives me a nice baseline map. And again, blue is not much activity. Red is high activity, a high prevalence. So how, what is headbanging? How do we do this? Next slide, please. Headbanging is essentially a median polished, robust smoothing algorithm that's very effective at preserving edges and removing outliers. So if you get a county that has one out of three positive next to counties that have maybe one out of 100 positive, that one out of three starts looking like an outlier. And headbanging will go. It works with triples. Now what a triple is is nothing more than three adjacent counties. So if you're in Atlanta, what you would you would grab maybe Fulton, DeKalb, and another county. But what you do, headbanging takes medium, medians, and the median of three numbers, for example, four percent, ten percent, and six percent, is just the middle number. It's six percent. 
So what you do, what headbanging does, is it is it goes and it computes a lot of medians. Excuse me. I think Dwight is saying something, but I haven't been able to hear you. No. Hello, Dwight. Yes. Were you saying something? No. Oh, okay. I heard some noise. All right. Well, well, back back here. You take medians of three county prevalence rates, and then you you will take a county like maybe DeKalb County in Atlanta, and you'll grab all the counties around it, and you'll make triples. So what we've done to make these maps is we actually use 45 different triples, our sets of three counties, each triple containing, say, DeKalb County. Um, what I like about this is this algorithm is named from a popular child's game with pins and face impressions. You may have seen it. You have this, this, you bang your face up against these pins and it leaves an impression of your face. So what it does is it preserves the features of your face, but it gets rid of the outliers. So you see your face in terms of the pins. Uh, sticking out. Now, here a good reference is a, I, I direct you to a 1999 stat medicine paper, and I'll also say varying in this algorithm is that we actually uh, weight via sample size. So we use binomial sampling with error margins, the variance of the binomial is P times 1 minus p divided by n if you take the sample prevalence. So we're actually weighting by sample sizes. Okay, so this gets me the baseline that I'm going to forecast from. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so how am I going to model and forecast? Well, with count data, one of the first things folks try is statistically what's called a Poisson regression. Now, I have the number of total tests here, and we're going to note that by county S as N sub S of T. P sub S at time T will be the, the, the prevalence rate of county S at time T. And what we do is we assume that the counts follow a Poisson model but we're parameterizing these as the Poisson parameter is n times p. The lambda parameter in the Poisson distribution is the number of tests times the, the probability of getting a positive test. And now what we do is we want to describe n p sub s of t. That's what we're we're getting after the prevalence. Sort of, we view, we view this as n sub s of t is given to us. The number of tests in each county is sort of fixed for us, and we have to explain the prevalences. Now, what we use with the Poisson regression is a logistic link. So we actually take because a prevalence is between zero and one. I, I'm sorry, not a logistic link, but a log link here, and we take the logarithm of it to get from minus infinity to plus infinity. And what we're going to do here is we're going to write this, the log of the prevalence probability is an overall mean beta naught plus regression coefficients beta i times factors, these x sub s i of t, and then these i sub s of t will represent random error. Now this capital L is the number of factors, and they're going to be things like the temperature of county S at time T, the population of county S at time T, and such. Okay, so if you get lost in the math, I'm hoping you will follow this anyway. I'll be brief. Next slide, please. Okay, the random effect xi sub S T here are used to induce temporal and spatial correlation. Okay, counties that are close to each other are probably going to report similar prevalence rates. That's spatial correlation. Also, in time, once an infection sets up 
you guys know it's hard to get rid of. Likewise, once you get rid of it, it takes some time to build back up again. Okay, so there is indeed both spatial and temporal correlation in these models, or in our data. Now, the paradigm that we use to model the space-time aspects of these is called the conditional autoregressive, the CAR paradigm. And these have proven quite useful in a lot of space-time modeling procedures. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so for heartworm disease for dogs, we're going to consider the following factors given to us. Annual temp, precipitation, and humidity. Geographically, we'll consider elevation, forest coverage, percent water coverage, society factors, population density and median household income, and we actually have the home range of eight different mosquito species, okay? Not counts, county by county counts of their abundances, but we just have home range and of these guys. And this is going to be zero one factors. Next slide, please. Okay, for Lyme disease, of course, mosquitoes are not considered, but we actually got hold of deer strike data, and we got this from, I believe it was State Farm Insurance Company, and they're able to tell us the probability that any one driver makes contact with a deer over a year, this probability. And that's actually indicative, because deers car deer carry ticks, that's indicative of contact between the tick host and, and dogs, okay? Now, in these factors, we know we're missing a lot. For example, preventative sales. Um, are we still here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. One of my computers just went. So we know we have missed important factors. The models from the factors that we're considering are, are actually quite good predictives, but we know our list is not exhaustive. Most of our limitations are our data deficiencies. Like for heartworm, no, I don't have a mosquito count of 80 projecti for each and every county across the United States in time. Uh, if you'd like to make suggestions, we'll certainly welcome those. Uh, I, I get, most of these vectors do not come with abundances. And the other thing is that we have five years of data, but we, we are using an annual forecast right now. As, we're, as we get on with this project, we're, we're, we're talking about methods to move this to real time. But right now, it's just annual. Next slide, please. OK. So what we do to forecast is we just take that regression equation, and a hat in statistics means we're estimating. And all I do is just estimate each one of these factors. I carry it into the next year. So that would be x sub si of t with a hat on it. That's my, that's my extrapolation of, say, population density in next year. And then I throw it back in the model. Okay. Now, statistically, there's a lot to deal with with these xi sub s terms that get you space-time correlation. And I won't go that go into that with this talk here. Next slide, please. OK. So I, I guess as I was saying, the factors are forecasted into next year. And we do this simply. So we use time series methods. We will take actually county by county in the United States. And, and CAPC has compiled many, many data sets now. We will take county by county temperatures from about 1900 to current to forecast next, the uh, county's next year temperature. And we usually do this with simple autoregressive time series methods. Uh, we, f we, factor, we, we forecast a lot of these factors with just simple linear regression. Uh, there is a lot of data scraping, web page reading, and it is a big data effort. Next slide, please. So I'm going to quickly run through some of the factors. And I want to be quick here because of time constraints. 
So this is, for example, United States temperatures. This is what we observed in 2011. Blue is cool, red is hot. It's the usual spatial structure of the United States temperatures. Next slide, please. Precipitation, green is wet in the east, orange is dry out in the Great Basin and west. Next slide, please. Relative humidities. I don't know why we used blue for humid, but we did. Orange is dry out there in Arizona and New Mexico, and that seems to make a lot of sense graphically. Next slide. County elevations. By county elevations, we're using the maximum elevation of the county. And this can be a little bit problematic out west. I don't know if you folks know, but in your county, California has both the highest, Mount Whitney, and lowest, Death Valley, point in the lower 48 United States. But back east, it's a pretty good, pretty good measure of overall county elevation. Next slide, please. Forestation coverage. I really need for this to be updated because my understanding is, is the United States is reforestating. And our latest, well, here's the 2007 result. Next slide, please. Surface water coverage, lots of lakes in the east, not many out in the desert. Next slide, please. Population density, I think you can see some cities there on the Pacific West. I see Dallas, Fort Worth in the red spot in Texas, and the east, of course. Uh, the I-95 corridor is quite populated. Next slide. Median household income, well, I guess blue down south here. I, I know South Carolina is a poor state where I am. Dwight, you guys are relatively rich up there in New York. Uh, I don't know what's. I'll take a loan. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a home range map of 80 Canada, I can't say the name, Canadian mosquitoes. And this is just absence presence. Okay, so there is no count available for this mosquito species. Next slide. Okay, finally, getting towards the end here. Let me show you what a forecast of both heartworm and Lyme for canines is. So I'm going to remind you of the baseline constructed for 2011 and 2015. And let's go to the next slide and see what the forecast is. OK. So that's a little bit different. I want you to look at that red spot out in Northern California. Remember what happened out there? It's been this last year. We had a, a pretty wet winter out there. They were in a big drought, but they've gotten a lot wetter over this last winter. Let me show you these two slides again. Next slide, please. So the baseline. And the next slide, please. The forecast. OK. Let's move to Lyme now. Next slide. Now, keep in mind, this is for dogs again. There will be questions like, can we use the dog forecast? For humans, I've been asked that a lot, and I will say we're working on it. But here is the baseline for Lyme. Move to the next slide, please. And the forecast. Notice in the forecast, we've got it spreading out a little bit. So in the next slide, let's see the baseline again. And the forecast on the next slide, please. OK. Next slide. Uh, these models have quite a good R-squared. We've been validating, vetting our forecast, and we're getting R-squares from about 60 to 90 percent. This project started off very in innocently, but I've got to say it's sort of gone viral. I was just doing the forecast to start off with. Now I've got two PhD students and a postdoc working full time on these. Uh, issues with these forecasts, we don't know traveling dogs. You could have a dog that gets infected with Lyme in Connecticut, goes on a ski vacation in Montana, starts 
exhibiting symptoms, and it shows up as a test in Montana. I will say, as a positive test in Montana, I will say by doing the disease mapping and looking and keeping track of things, we used to argue about home ranges of diseases. Almost all the time, the data have been right. When people doubted whether a disease was present and the data was showing it was, the data have been right. Uh, Lyme disease is a huge issue with uh, its home range, its spread, and with zoonosis. Next slide. Uh, for published papers, we have been writing a lot of this in parasites and vectors. Uh, our forecasts are shown to, are these forecasts that you're seeing now, we show these to about 250 million TV viewers in the USA. Uh, we do that usually in April in a, what, what CAPC calls a satellite media tour. We're working on getting regional forecasts and showing these on the Weather Channel, the Animal Planet Channel, and the likes. Uh, again, our forecasts are yearly. Uh, we will be moving to real time in a few years. And it would be interesting to see if we could use like Google Trends and Twitter citations and counts and hit counts there. But they have not come in on an annual forecast yet. Okay, next slide. I'd like to turn it back over to Dwight, who's now going to finish this up and tell you what we're going to do. I mean, is, it, is disease intervention useful? So Dwight, let me pass back to you. So the map you just saw was a map of the, you going to run it again? So this is a map from the Carter Foundation. And uh, my goal with data and data display and forecasting and studying trends is because my goal is intervention. So my goal is to stop things from happening. Uh, CDC did a whole lot of work and is still doing a whole lot of work with the Carter Foundation. And one of that is based on mapping things. And these maps of Chad, uh, maps of Africa, are critical to being able to figure out what's going on. And perhaps we may be able to also help with forecasting. But I'm a huge believer in mapping data and looking at it relative to intervention. Next slide, please. And as you all know, this is an unbelievable success story. We are, in 2016, the last time I checked, we are down to seven cases, from three million down to, was it three million? Three million cases down to seven in just a few years. That is called success. Hopefully, it is going to disappear completely. I hear CDC has it stored in a freezer somewhere, the DNA, in case we ever have to recreate the guinea worm, but I'm not sure a whole lot of people would like to do that. Next slide, please. Malaria eradication, mapping has played a huge part in disease eradication in this country. I point out that we had a whole lot of malaria back in the 1800s. There was malaria in Ithaca, New York back uh, when Cornell was founded. Cornell is up on a hill because when you were down where the city is, uh, that is actually where they had malaria every year. So malaria was huge and we have slowly pushed it out of the United States of America. Next slide, please. It was important in the United States. It probably changed in a great sense uh, the course of the war with, uh, between the North and the South. The uh, thing about it was is we rapidly took New Orleans and we had a blockade and the Confederacy was trapped and they could no longer get quinine. Their soldiers got sick by the thousands and as you can see down here in 1861 and 1862 they had 800,000 of diseases, cases of disease in the military in the South excluding gunshot wounds amongst Confederate troops. And as you can see, 14% were due to malaria. Okay, this was only 140, 50 years ago. Uh, 115,000 had malaria and 1,300 people died from that malaria. Okay? So disease has impact. Next slide. Now all our cases are imported. Hopefully it's not going to start spreading again. We have good vectors in the United States. The Anopheles is still here. But again, as you can see from these uh, CDC maps in the life cycle, it is here, but it occasionally gets spread from a couple people. There's been cases in 
around Newark Airport where it's gotten off a plane and a couple of people have gotten infected. So there has been the occasional talk on this thing, but we rapidly jumped on it and kept it from spreading. So malaria is not here. Next slide, please. So we're in the dog world. The map on the left here shows you roundworms and hookworms and whipworms in dogs, okay, in different colors. And these are from, the bottom got cut off, but we have the uh, north, south, east, and west. The south is the, uh, the high one there with the ancillosum with the high yellow color. And the, uh, so we can see the northeast, the midwest, the southeast, and the far west. And as you can see, I think the west is on the left, the west is lowest. But nonetheless, those are shelter animals. The bottom doesn't really matter. And if you look on the right, these are animals that have been taken care of by veterinarians. And the numbers are really, really low. And so we really don't have We've cut these numbers down to 1%, 2%, 3%. And so basically, it just simply shows that if you deworm animals, they don't have worms. Next slide, please. So in the world of veterinary medicine, we have two important papers that have come out showing you that intervention does work. OK? Uh, yes, it's, yes, if you prevent disease, you don't have disease. But however, I think it's important that periodically show that what's really happening is if you prevent, prevent disease, you don't have disease. So could I have the next slide, please? This is work by Drs. Gates and Dr. Nolan at the University of Pennsylvania. I think it's a great paper, and it is a validation that veterinarians, by treating animals, are doing a really good job. Next slide, please. So here we have the launch of products. They are A, B, and C. Product A is ivermectin in heart guard. So this is the drug that got the Nobel Prize this year, okay, for the human side of stuff, but it was huge in animal medicine as well. And it is the heartworm preventive. And when heartworm came out in heart guard, the dose was not enough to touch ascarids, okay? Soon after heart guard came out, interceptor came out, which is another macrocyclic lactone, novomycin oxine, which does get ascarids. And then HeartGuard Plus came out where they mixed in pyrantal pamylate, the C. They mixed in the pyrantal pamylate there. And the two together gave a whopping dose to asteroids. And so the prevalence went basically down from 6% to 2 or 3%, OK, after the drugs were given to the dogs at the University of Pennsylvania. These are University of Pennsylvania clinical cases. Next slide, please. Hookworms. So, Ivermectin and HeartGuard had almost no effect at the dose because the dose was for, for hookworms. So there was very little dose against uh, effect on hookworms. Then Interceptor came out, and as you can see, Interceptor got hookworms, kills hookworms, and it rapidly brought the numbers down. And then with HeartGuard Plus, when they got all the dogs at Penn on either HeartGuard Plus or Interceptor, you can see the number of dogs that had hookworms was knocked way down. Uh, from basically 12% down to 1%. Next slide, please. Whipworms. The only product that's there that had efficacy against whipworms was uh, the milbomycin oxine. And as you can see, all the dogs that had whipworms were placed on milbomycin oxine. And as you can see, they rapidly took that down in the city of Philadelphia from 12% down to about 2 or 3%. Next slide. And here what we see is tapeworms. Now, neither of these products, D or E, are killing tapeworms. These products are killing fleas, and this is dipolidium because these are city dogs. And what happened was they had dipolidium coming in in these city dogs. They're not out eating rabbits. These are city dogs. And once they had good flea control with these two products, uh, lufenuron and fipronil, they basically wiped out the, the fleas, and that wiped out the tapeworms. And this has all been very well documented in this very nice bit of work by Gates and Nolan. Next slide, please. And then Eschner and Mugna in 2015 showed that if you keep dogs on tick preventives and you give them vaccine, that you can stop them from seroconverting to Lyme, Borrelia burgdorferi. Next slide, please. And they showed they reported obvious but important results from a clinical study in Maine and their work verified that if you vaccinate client-owned dogs for Lyme disease and keep them on tick control, basically you will. They used an OPSA vaccine and they kept them on tick control. And dogs living in areas with Lyme disease need to be vaccinated against Lyme disease and on year-round tick prevention. And then they won't seroconvert. Uh, and it's year-round because I live up here and I know lots of people can have a tick, get on them, and bite them 
when the snow is a foot deep. Next slide, please. Okay, one last little bit here is Florida. Before the monthly preventives, Florida, 1984 to 1989, 60% of shelter dogs had heartworms. 60%, and this is a large study by Necrops of 876 dogs. Next slide, please. And Florida now is low. If you look at this layer on the right, you will see Florida is lower than all the other southern states. Louisiana is at 7%. Mississippi is at 8%. Okay, Arkansas is at 4%. Even Texas is at 3%. Next slide, please. And Florida is stuck. In all our maps, it's stuck at 1.3%. That's where it is. It doesn't go up. It stays right at 1.3%. Next slide. And if you look at shelter dogs now in Florida, they're at 14.6%. And we have very close data from the same counties showing that the prevalence is right where you'd expect in the pets, 1.4%, just like on the CAPC maps. Next slide, please. So the question I ask you here is, there's the shelters on the left from 1984, there's the shelters on the right from 2010, and there's the pets in the middle of 2014. So are Floridians succeeding in suppressing all of Harlem and Florida? Are they actually having a herd effect? and keeping even dogs that are not seeing veterinarians from getting infected. Next slide, please. I also want to point out that in this country compared to Europe, okay, our cats here, our cats here in the United States at shelters are in green, the European cats are in red, and the cats that come to clinics are in yellow or tan or light tan. I'm not quite sure what that is. So if you look, EU cats basically have the same percentage of parents. Twenty percent of the EU cats have toxic care cat eye, which is the same as we see in the shelter cats in New York State. And when we get down to cats seeing veterinarians, very few cats see veterinarians often enough. When we get to cats in the United States of America, we are down at four percent, four and a half percent. And the same thing goes on for Ancelostoma, the hookworms. They're high. They're about the same in the shelter animals for allurostrondros, the longworm cats, and even for dipalidium. We don't have the data for, um, but I can tell you ours are probably much lower in cats seeing veterinarians in the United States of America uh, than these numbers that we see for shelter cats and for European cats. Next slide, please. And that's yours, Robert. Yeah, I'd like to say a few thanks to folks before we close out here and take some questions. There. Are, Definitely should be a thanks to the Companion Animal Parasite Council, who over the last five years has sponsored this research. I could name Julia Sharp, Dong Mei Wong, Yan Liu, Stella Watson, Chris McMahon at Clemson, Bill Stitch at Missouri, Michael Yabsley at Georgia, and I think there's probably now about another five to eight parasitologists and other people working on this. One thing that worries me. I'm a statistician, and I'm getting a rapid course in epidemiology, but if you all have suggestions, they're most welcome. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dr. Lunn and Dr. Bowman. We will now have the question and answer session. As a reminder, you may submit a question using the webinar system by clicking on the questions tab located in the webinar toolbar and then typing in your question. Or you may click on the raise your hand icon on the webinar screen and your line will be unmuted so that you may ask a question. Please state your name and then ask your question. Looks like we already have our first question. Have you considered looking at shelter dog movement from smaller, less well-funded to more supported shelters, dogs that are also at a higher likelihood of not being on prophylaxis, for example, the movement of dogs um, south, southeast, or to shelters in areas with lower heartworm prevalence. Do you want to take this, Dwight? Well, you can take it relative to the data set. How about that? And then I'll talk to it relative to the culture of moving dogs. Okay. Okay. I don't think that any shelter dogs are included in our data set. Uh, we have studies, and as Dwight has shown, we do have studies showing that 
the, the, the prevalence rates of some of these pathogens are five times in the shelter what they are in the general pet population. Would you like to add to that, Dwight? Right. We're seeing lots of dog movement from the south up to the north. Uh, and so we do have the movement of shelter dogs. We know that. Uh, and so we have them coming up. We know they are heartworm positive. Uh, I don't think compared to the 9, billion data point, 9 million data points, I don't think it is doing much to the maps uh, because we're, though we're talking about moving lots of dogs, uh, the reality is, is I don't think it is changing things drastically. And we see it in states that I don't think are getting a whole lot of dogs as well. Okay, our next question. What is your denominator when you discuss the prevalence? Do you actually have dog population counts, or is this just the percentage of positive uh, dogs tested? Uh, no, it's, we, we could try to recover the number of dogs. There are estimates of that. But this is just the data that are reported. And admittedly, there are probably going to be some biases in who reports. But each test is just one that is reported to a central data bank. Can I say something here? Sure. It's a difference, and it's also a difference between how we do things, where we do it by, by test uh, performed. And if you look at many of the CDC maps, they are per population because you have the human population maps, which we don't have. Right. These maps are not per capita disease rates. They're, they're just what we have observed. OK. All right, next question. Could you please share the citations for the papers that were referenced in the presentation? Yes, um, a lot of them, I'm going to have to look these up, have appeared in a journal called Parasites and Vectors. So let me see how quickly I can go to my Vita and my other computer. Uh, there's, there's one paper on the map meeting which just lists who came, what factors we posited, and the other ones are largely on heartworm. Okay, although, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do, okay, here we go, I'm on the window. Okay, so let me send you to the most recent one. would be one in this year, and it's in Parasites and Vectors, Issue 9, pages 169 to 178. And it will have a lot of the map modeling details in it. Also, I have one hard off, hot off the press on heartworm. Uh, it's in a second round of review of Parasite and Vectors, but if you want it, just send me a mail at Lund, I'm, I'm easy, L-U-N-D, at clemson.edu, and I'll pass that on to you. And it will have references to most of the other papers that we've written. Are there any positive cases from lab submissions only, and then what about SNAP tests? I didn't catch the first part of that question, but Dwight, I think this is in your domain. Did I hear a laugh? The first part of the question was, are the positive cases from lab submissions only? So it's a little complicated. Yes and no. So it is from lab cases only. The thing is, is that uh, if the data is, if people have done like a snap test that gets put into one of these cassette readers, in a practice that will get sent to IDEX, and so that is data is then collected. And I also I'm not quite sure what Antec does, but they may do something similar. So if people have these 
SNAP readers that they have in their office, and if they stick one in there, that gets put onto a machine and that data is collected from their offices and then uh, shared with their laboratories. All right. I, I, should, I should point out just a stray comment here that one of the great things about this data set that CAPC has, has helped collect is that dog data is not nearly as private as human data. All right, our next question. Did you consider pet population density? No, but we should. But we just talked about it, and it's very, we actually talked about the last, what was it? We talked about the last ABMA study that was done, and it's hard to get. Well, uh, let, let, let me elaborate on that. Um, so currently, we have a disconnect between the way CAPC is recording data and the CDC reports data, because the CDC only reports positive counts, at least that we know of. They don't report people who have tested and tested negative, whereas CAPC does. Now, the best way to put all these measurements on a common scale is to put them on per dog or per human. Uh, that requires very good population density studies, which we sort of have, and also population of dog densities. I mean, who owns dogs and what are their tendencies? spatial differences throughout the U.S. Now, where this is coming up is as we try to relate Lyme in both humans and dogs in tandem. We have to put these data sets on the same scale. And that is currently work undertaken, actually, by my team and others at CAPC. All right, we have time for one more question. Is there any advantage, is there any other advantage for doing smoothing over an individual county prevalence model besides accounting for sample size? Can you repeat that? Sure. Is there any other advantage for doing smoothing over an individual county prevalence model besides accounting for sample size? Uh, some of these sample sizes are so small. If you're, if you're asking what smoothing method should you use, I, I'm not sure I understand county by county, but some of the sample sizes we have are as low as one test. And so if you have one test, you know, your sample prevalence is either zero or one. So any model that reports any legitimate prevalence is going to be, you know, like one, two, three, four, five percent. You're going to be way off there. So it is natural to wait. By the, by the number of tests. Now, can I tell you that creaking is better or thin pipe blinds would work just as well as head banging? The advantage with head banging is it tends to exclude things that just don't make sense. It works very well with rough data. You know, if you another case where this would come up if you were trying to estimate snow, snow, uh, snow packs or things and you were in the snow belt of, of the Great Lakes, you would want very fine edges there. And Kriegen and thin plate splines would just average everything through and you would never get those features. Or if you were out in Denver and you were trying to compare the high country with the plains out there, these definitive ridges. I'm not sure I answered your question very well there. On behalf of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine and CDC's Clinician Outreach Communication Activity, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thank you to our presenters, Dr. Lund and Dr. Bowman. Great thank continuing you. education credits are available for this call. If you would like to receive continuing education, you should complete the online evaluation by September 30th, 2016 using course code WC2286. For those who will view the archived webinar after September 30th, complete the online evaluation between October 1st, 2016 and September 30th, 2018 using course code WD2286. All continuing education and contact hours for COCA conference calls 
are issued through TCE Online, CDC's Training and Continuing Education Online System at www. The number two, the letter A. dot cdc. dot gov forward slash tce online. The archived webinar will be posted on the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine's webpage at acvpm. dot org. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls, subscribe to COCA by sending an email to COCA at cdc. dot gov and write subscribe in the subject line. That's C. At cdc.gov. Also, CDC has launched a Facebook page for clinicians. Please like our page at facebook.com forward slash CDC Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity to receive COCA updates. Thank you again for being part of today's webinar. We hope everyone has a nice day.